Uh, my name is Pastor Kurt. I'm one of the pastors around here. We are starting a brand new series called Skeptical. And uh, we're going to actually start with a very important question. I want you to get your sermon notes out. You know, um, we are going to fill in some blanks today, people. Uh, because we've got so much content. Turn to your neighbor and say, turn on your frontal lobe right now. we got so much content. Sit up straight. Take some oxygen in. We are, we're, go we're going to blaze through like, you know, I have for 15 to 20 years, I have been doing a seminar on Can You Trust the Bible? And I use it, it takes me about two hours to go through this seminar. I have got this one down for you to an hour and 90 minutes, an hour and 90 minutes. We might just make the game. Uh, before we do that, can I give you one little update? We have a brand new campus in Auburn, California, everyone. And it's actually reaching a lot more people. In fact, they're meeting right now without me. Oh, Lord, help them. And, um, and I, got, I got a couple favors I want to ask for you. Number one, if you know anyone from the Auburn area, all around that area, Auburn, Grass Valley, Cool, Colorado, I don't care. As far as up as they go, would you let them know that we're starting to meet week to week in, and we're going to do a big, huge grand opening seven weeks out from Easter. we got so many great plans, kids, students. We have more students meeting right now before we go week to week than uh, most youth groups in America. It's incredible what's going on up there. So would you tell someone? Number two, would you pray for us? We need prayer. Amen. And number three, if you're a Granite Bay person, would you stay here and plug in here? Because we want to grow both these campuses at the same time. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah, there you go. Pray and be faithful here and tell it, spread the word. And then one other little thing on my heart before we start today. My favorite thing we do at Bayside is Mexicali, Mexico. It's already coming up. I have been talking to the team that's leading it. Here's really a serious thing from my heart to yours, please. I need 30 more adults to volunteer to take our students down there. This is the problem you want when we have more students that want to go than we do have adult volunteers. So our registration with students is going through the roof. I need 30 more volunteers. And here's the kicker. I need 25 more translators. 25. 25 more translators. Gracias, Señor, por su buena comida. In the number de Jesus. If you understood what I just said, <laughs> it's the only Spanish I got. Thank you, God, for this food. <laughs> I know comida. I know el baño. I just know a little bit. If you understood any of that, I want you to go right out to the table and talk to them. We desperately need your help. All right, let's get into this thing. We got a lot to do here. Um, the four attacks on the Bible and how to answer each. Maybe attacks might be a little bit too aggressive. There are attacks on the Bible, especially online, especially with a group called the New Atheists nowadays, and they're very aggressive. But actually, most of what I'm going to teach you today, I um, started by just having honest conversations with people, like the conversations you have at a funeral. I like funeral conversations. Now, nowadays, we don't call them funerals. We call them memorials or celebrations of life. And I get that. I get that. But I like the old school. Where I like a funeral because there is grief involved. There is sadness involved. And we shouldn't, you know, sure, celebrate the good. But we should embrace the grief. And I think there's three stages to a funeral. See if you agree with me. The first stage is the uncomfortable stage. So you go, you show up to the funeral, you don't know what to say, you don't know where to sit, you, you don't want to say something dumb to the family, you know, you shake hands, you look at people, it's awkward. Then, the next thing that happens is they have the eulogies and the slideshows and all that. And something at a really good funeral happens that all, happens almost no other place. When someone gets up there and they start recounting how much they love this person that has passed, you and I start getting honest. We start actually thinking about the one question we should be thinking about all the time, the one question that's more abundantly obvious than any other fact in life, the fact that our life someday will be over. We start contemplating eternity and the end of life, and then you go through the awkward stage, then you got the eulogy stage where you start actually thinking honestly and contemplating your own life. And then the third stage of a good funeral is the eating of carbohydrate stage. <laughs> this is the way Americans 
assuage their grief. We go right from the funeral service into a buffet line and we minister to our souls with scalp potatoes. And if you stay long enough for that meal, every once in a while, someone will lean into you and they'll say, Pastor Kurt, do you really believe what you said up there? Or Pastor Kurt, what happens really when we die? Or Pastor Kurt, does the Bible really teach that? Whenever I get these honest questions, I always do the same thing. I just tell them the gospel straight up. I just go, yeah, there is a God. I believe there's a God. I believe we've sinned against that God, but I believe he loves us so much that Jesus, fully God and fully man, came to earth and died in our place. But you, my friend, have to accept his forgiveness to spend eternity with him. And when you preach the gospel, when you just say the gospel, when you have this honest conversation, you, you'll, sometimes you'll get this, people go, yeah, but, yeah, but do you really believe in the Bible? Do you, do you believe all those miracles? Do you believe all that stuff? Isn't that, hasn't that been changed? This teaching that we're going to do this morning is based on the sort of questions that have come up in my life, working with university students especially for the last 30 years. They're the late night conversations at Denny's. They're the post-funeral conversations. They're the things that we really want to ask. And even some Christians are afraid to ask these questions because they secretly believe if they really looked into it, they might discover that the Bible is not as reliable as they've been told. What are those questions? Let's get right to it. I'm going to explain all four questions, and then we're just going to march through the content. If you're still with me, give me an amen. amen. Here's the first one. The Bible is filled with fable and myth. I can't trust the Bible. It's got supernatural events. We all know that supernatural events are made up. They, they're fabulized. They've been added over the years, and so I don't trust it. This is Thomas Jefferson. He cut all the supernatural parts out of his Bible. Or Richard Dawkins, Chris Hitchens, there's a whole bunch of them that believe this. Number two, the argument is the New Testament was created long after Jesus' life by Constantine or some popes, some bishops, these guys in Rome. It was 400 years, 300 years after Jesus, and they cobbled together the little bits of myth about Jesus, and they created Christianity that we know today as a way of controlling people. This myth is most commonly, uh, recently brought up by Dan Brown. Does anyone know who Dan Brown is? That's the Da Vinci Code. You remember the Da Vinci Code? It's the movie with her, with uh, Tom Hanks, and he's got the mullet just like mine. Yeah, that's what that argument is. Number, uh, number three, the Bible. Sorry, Tom Hanks, the mullet. It got me off. The Bible endorses slavery, violence, genocide, and injustice. The Bible's just bad. This is the one that's primarily argued by these, this group we call the New Atheists. It's Richard Dawkins, Chris Hitchens, Sam Harris, etc. And it used to be, the argument used to go like this. The Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God. The Old Testament God is mean and judgmental, and the New Testament God is kind and nice. Now, they've taken it to another extreme, and they've just said, listen, this God of the Old Testament, he's not just different, he's horrible. He's a tyrant. He's unpredictable. He can't be real because he's so mean. And then the last argument against the Bible, the last attack that goes on is, the Bible has been changed over and over and over many years. This is usually argued by people that actually kind of like the Bible, but they say, yeah, you can't trust all of it. Well, what parts can you trust? The parts I agree with. That's the parts you could trust. And we'll look at that very, very thing. Let's go right into it. I'm not going to be too clever today. I'm going to give you the attack, and then I'm going to give you the answer, and we'll talk a little bit about it, and we'll get out of here way before even the pregame uh, your, your nacho cheese isn't even going to be soft by the time we get out of here. Okay, number one. The Bible is just fable and myth. The Bible is just fable and myth. Here's the answer. Write it in. This claim is based on an anti-supernatural bias and a misunderstanding of what defines fable, legend, and myth. So there's two problems with this argument. The first problem is it's really not an argument against the Bible. It's an argument for atheistic materialism. Now, what is atheistic materialism? It's not atheists that refuse God but like to shop. That's not the right materialism. Atheistic materialism means I believe only in material. I believe there's nothing else in reality besides material. So there's no supernatural event. We don't have spirits. 
There's nothing above and beyond material. And so what they're saying is, I immediately reject the Bible because it has supernatural events in it. The problem with this is not only is it an argument for atheism, so it's not even the right argument. We should be talking atheism versus theism before we, the Bible even gets into it. It's also anti-investigation. We, instead of looking into these miracles and looking into these texts and saying, what's really going on here? We just dismiss it all by saying, it's supernatural, it's done, I'm moving on, there is no such thing as supernatural. Mark Clark has a brilliant quote in The Problem of Jesus. And I want to tell you, we're going to have a bibliography for all these talks. You want to go out there and get some of these books. Start with this one, The Problem of Jesus. Here's what our pastor Mark says. The mistakes skeptics make regarding miracles is first the assuming that nature is a closed system. In other words, that this is all there is. Frequently I will find young atheists on the college campus, and I'll say, I'm an atheist. And I said, really? You're an atheist. You're an atheist. So, And I'll ask them, do you know how small our planet is? Do you know how small our solar system is? Do you know how small our galaxy is? Our galaxy is a backwater galaxy, and we're in a backwater solar system on a tiny little planet of millions and millions and millions and millions of galaxies. Do you realize how big the universe is? And yet, you here at Northwestern State Community College of Glory have figured out that in that expansive universe, there is no God. You know all of it. And they'll go, well, when you put it that way. <laughs> the mistake skeptics make regarding miracles is first the assuming that nature is a closed system that defines the entirety of reality. We see all of the reality. They have mistaken a part of the system that defines reality, what we call nature, for the whole. In other words, there's more than we can see. And we shouldn't be anti-investigation. If you want to reject the Bible because of the supernatural, listen to me now. That's okay. But first, please have the right debate. It's atheism versus theism. Okay? Is there no God, therefore God never talks? Or could there be a God? And if there is a God, does he want to speak to us? We're going to talk about this more later in this whole series. But I'm just going to give you one evidence for theism. You want one evidence? Turn to a neighbor, someone you know. Don't do this to someone you don't know. Go ahead, turn to a neighbor and pinch him. Go ahead, pinch him, pinch him. If they were slow getting in the car today, pinch him hard. I didn't say hit him. She's hitting him. I said pinch him. Did anyone say ow? You know what ow indicates. It indicates that they're alive and they're here. See, nothing comes from nothing. We're here is one of the biggest evidence that there is a God. Not only are we here, but this world, this universe, in fact, to the nth degree has been designed for life. We are here. I'll take it a step further. Not only are we here, which is evidence that there's something beyond time and space and matter that put us here, I believe he was here. I think there's credible historical evidence that Jesus walked the earth when he said he walked the earth and he died on the cross when he said he died on the cross and that he conquered death itself. So we are here is great evidence and he was here is also great evidence and I'll give you one more. It's not just that we are here and he was here. I believe he's still here. You could still see him move. You can experience these miracles. So first of all, we've got to ask the question of theism versus atheism. Don't worry. I'm not going to go over your heads. I want to talk just for a second also about the idea of are these miracles, especially in the New Testament, are they legend? So C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest literary minds of our time, he rejects this idea that the New Testament is filled with myth and legend. And the reason he rejects it is he's an expert on myth and fable and le legend. Listen to C.S. Lewis here. I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, and myths all my life. I know what they are like. And I know that not one of these fables is like the Gospel of John or any of the other Gospels. What he's saying is, I'm an expert in fable. These do not sound... Think about this. When Jesus lays his hand on the leper and heals the leper, he says, now I want you to go to the religious leaders and present yourself. He doesn't say and live happily ever after. No, they're too human. They're too detailed. The woman with the issue of blood, Jairus' daughter being sick, 
These don't read like Hansel and Gretel or King Midas' touch. They read, like, they read like real humans in a real world. All right, number two. Let's keep going because I got too excited about number one. Number two is this. The New Testament was created long after Jesus' life by Constantine. So this is kind of the argument, uh, like I said, of the Da Vinci Code. Uh, real Christianity got lost and these mean, evil men in some secret society, you know, the Templars of glory, they changed Christianity and got rid of all the women. And, the, and, and it's usually Constantine is wrapped up in this sort of myth and, and Harrison Ford. So, you know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a good I'll give you a good example of this. This is an actual person that commented on one of our podcasts here at Bayside. He wrote this. At the instruction of Emperor Constantine, the New Testament was compiled at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. A group of Christian leaders edited a selection of these lores, fables, myths about an influential spiritual leader called Jesus that had lived three centuries earlier. Oh, my goodness. 300 years ago. Four of these stories served as the basis for this testament. Those Jesus stories that didn't fit the Roman pur purpose were labeled uncanonical. They're forbidden. They're horrible. And the empire, you can almost hear the, the Darth Vader music right here, can't you? And the empire attempted to destroy all of these worthy alternative gospels, like the Gospel of Mary or the Gospel of Thomas. How many have ever heard of these gospels? Okay. Is this a historical expert writing this? Is this a New Testament scholar? Who is this? That, um, this is a guy named Taco. That's his handle, at least. And, and, and can I just say this? No expert actually believes what Taco believes. Lots of people on the Internet believe this. Lots of people that watch Her uh, uh, not Harrison Ford, uh, Tom Hanks movies believe this. But this is not real history. Here's the answer to this one. By the 4th century, there were too many Christians to hijack the well-established faith. Furthermore, the apostles' insistence on, this is so important, write this one in, the rule of faith ensured that authentic Christianity survived. What do I mean by there was too many Christians, and this couldn't have happened, and the rule of faith? This is so important. You see... We get this idea that a small group of evil men hijacked Christianity and perverted it and changed it. And we don't have authentic Christianity. But, but listen to Dr. Bart Ehrman. Now, Dr. Bart Ehrman and I, we disagree on almost everything. He's one of these guys who doesn't believe in the supernatural. He doesn't believe the New Testament documents are authentic. This is the one area where he and I totally agree. Listen to this. Emperor Const Constantine, Erdman says had nothing to do with the formation of the canon, all of the books in the New Testament, of Scripture. He did not choose which books to include or exclude. He did not order the destruction of the Gospels that were left out of the canon. This is wholly a myth that somehow in, in the 4th century Christianity got invented in a different form. It just doesn't happen. Wait, Kurt, what about those missing Gospels? What about the Gospel of Thomas? Anyone here ever heard of the Gospel of Thomas? I'll tell you exactly where we found the first version of the Gospel of Thomas in a minute. But the Gospel of Thomas is a Gnostic document. Everyone say Gnostic. Gnostic. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a Gnostic. You can't say Gnostic without a British accent. You're Gnostic. Gnostic was a Greek religion, a Greek idea that the flesh was corrupt and that we were captured in the flesh. And what happened is the Gnostics saw that Jesus, who came in the flesh, they didn't like that. Jesus was gaining popularity. The more and more Christians. So what they did is they hitched their bandwagon to the Jesus movement. And they wrote the Gospel of Thomas. We know that it's written much later than the Gospels because it's written in a penmanship that is lowercase and different than the penmanship of the authentic Gospels. Here's also how we know it. It's not even a narrative. It doesn't tell the life of Jesus. It tells all this gobbledygook of wisdom literature because Gnosticism, I hope I'm not giving you too much information, but here we go. Gnosticism was a mystery religion. What does that mean? You can escape the flesh, but only if you know the secret. So this is how the Gospel of Thomas reads, if you've ever read it. It reads like this. And then a great niner came against the raven in the sky after defeating the lion. 
Is anyone with me? That's pretty good how I did that. If you don't understand that, find someone with a jersey and they'll give you the interpretation. Okay? That's what it's not like. Our, it's not like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell the story of Jesus from eyewitnesses. It's all this Gnostic stuff. And yet, what happens, even if you go on Wikipedia to this day and you read about it, they won't tell you that difference. They'll just say, oh, this was not included. It's not a part of your Bible because it didn't have anything to do with the real Jesus. And this is just fact. All right, I got to move on. I'm getting so fired up here. Okay, is anyone getting anything out of this? Um, okay, let's talk about the rule of faith for a second. What is the rule of faith? Dr. Matthew Harmon, he's one of my favorites, professor of New Testament studies, Grace Theological Seminary. The gospel message, or the rule of faith, as the early church sometimes called it, is what gave birth to the inspired documents that compromised our New Testament, comprised, not compromised, that comprised our New Testament. What, what does he mean? He means that from the very beginning, the apostles and their disciples and the early church fathers, the people that lived right after the apostles and their disciples, they were highly committed to keeping the authentic teaching of Jesus. This was a big priority. And once you understand the rule of faith, you see it all over the New Testament. I'll give you an example of it. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. This is the Great Commission, very famous. This is how we read it nowadays. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We're like, yeah, go. We're going to go on a missions trip. Go, go, go. They didn't read it that way. They read it this way. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's the rule of faith. Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. Don't leave any of Jesus' teaching out. The Greek word for everything in this passage, you know what it is? It's everything. I don't care if you don't like that joke and you're tired of it. I love that joke. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commands. You know what that means? Don't do anything different than Jesus commanded. Do authentic Jesus. Paul in the rule of faith. Peter in the rule of faith. Early church fathers in the rule of faith. Here's Paul. I'll give you two examples. Three maybe. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. How many have ever heard this verse before? You heard this verse before? First time I heard this, I was like, Paul is so arrogant. Follow me. Follow me, everyone. I mean, if I came out here and I said, Mark Clark, Andrew McCart, Ray, Lisa Thompson, don't follow them. Follow me. I fill in the blanks. You know, you... Someone would throw a tomato at me, and they should, right? So this is not what Paul is saying. He's not saying, I'm better than everyone. What he's saying is, I have received the authentic teaching of Jesus from the apostles, and I am handing it on to you, so follow this authentic teaching that I got from the apostles. It's the rule of faith. It's a commitment to saying, we're not changing what Jesus taught us. Here's how he says it in Galatians, and this is even stronger. Even if an angel should share a different gospel, don't follow that angel. He writes this in 2 Timothy. The things you have heard me say, entrust only those things to reliable witnesses who will entrust them to others, who will entrust them to others. He says it in 1 Corinthians. I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. For I received what I passed it on to you of what? Of first importance, he says in 1 Corinthians. In other words, it was very, very important to the early disciples that they not change the teaching of Jesus. They didn't add to it. They didn't subtract to it. They were committed to Jesus. And we benefit from that. All right, I got to keep going, man. I'm getting too fired up by this. All right, let's review. Everyone take a breath. Take a breath. Some of you are like, I didn't want to go to school today. I wanted to go to church. It's all right. Here's the review. Just because the Bible has miracles in it, doesn't mean it's false. And the New Testament does not read like a myth or a legend. It reads like real history. There are too many Christians and too many communities of Christians by the 4th century for anyone in the Roman Empire to change or hijack Christianity. And also, the apostles and the early church fathers were committed to preserving the authentic teaching of Christ through the rule of faith. We could stop right there, but I'm not going to. Number three. Here we go. The Bible endorses slavery, violence, genocide, and injustice. Okay, that one's true. Number four. 
I am so praying. That's a good joke, but I'm so praying they don't just get that clip and put it on the internet right there. <laughs> this is end my career right there. So, The Bible endorses slavery, violence, genocide, and injustice. We're going to have some fun with this one. Uh, or is God of the Old Testament one big tyrant? So there are some challenging passages in the Old Testament in how God works. The, the, what you need to do here is learn how to think exegetically. Everyone say exegetically. This is a fancy word that means when I come to any literature, by the way, but the Bible especially, I come with the right heart and the right tools to get the original meaning. I don't come with my agenda. I come with the right heart and the right tools to get the original meaning. The right tools are understanding the context, the language, the culture, the time, the history. Here's the answer to this idea that the Bible endorses slavery, etc. The Bible is written for us but not to us. God didn't write the Bible to any of you in here. He wrote it for all of you. The Bible is written to bronze and iron age people and first century people. Therefore, to get the original meaning of what God really intended, we have to actually ask the questions, what were those people thinking? What was the occasion? What was the conflict? What was going on in the world at that time? To get the original meaning. Most of the misunderstanding about God being mean in the Old Testament has to do with the fact that we bring our postmodern sensibilities to Iron Age uh, dynamics. And I'll tell you what, if you get this idea that the Bible was written to them but for us, it starts coming alive to you. The Bible is written for us but not to us. To understand these challenging Old Testament passages accurately, we need three key exegetical understandings. So we get the right understanding, and I'm going to do some drawing for you. How many want some drawing right here? Okay. So here's part of the problem. This first bullet right here. Not everything in the Old Testament describes what uh, is what God prescribes. Not everything that is in the Old Testament that the Old Testament describes is what God prescribes. In other words, God doesn't mean to endorse everything you read in the Old Testament. What God does is he just gives us an honest picture of what's going on. And this is disorienting to us because what we don't realize is we, we think everything has been kind of cleaned up and idealized. Because most of history is that way. Most of history, uh, George Washington, for instance, George Washington's bust, you can go see it, Washington, D.C. He's got broad shoulders. He's wearing a toga, by the way. And he's just like, bro, this tough, big man. George Washington was an old man with sunken shoulders and wooden teeth. He didn't look that way. We made him look that way because we idealize. All of history does this. Um, let me give you an example of the pharaohs, Okay. Um, what does a pharaoh look like? We've all seen the picture of the pharaoh. They got the, they got the really wonderful profile, big uh, nose, giant chin. Bruh, they're just tough. Bruh, I've got to come and conquer you. And uh, they got wonderful eye makeup, you know, here. Oh, yeah. And then they wear these cool hats. The hat goes like this, and it comes down here. and goes out like that. It's got nice colors. goes around, and then they got a snake right here. Yeah, they got a snake here. You slant the eyes, little tongue. <laughs> Right? That's your basic pharaoh. Now, here's the thing. If you look at them, big, muscly neck, broad shoulders, broad shoulders. They all got broad shoulders. One arm is always going like this, and it's, whole, it's got muscles on it, and it's holding this staff right here, and the staff is incredible. And then uh, this arm's down here. And then what's really interesting, broad shoulders, but really skinny waist, really skinny waist. <laughs> And they, they all have abs. They have abs right there. And they look awesome. Is that what a pharaoh really looks like? You go look at the pharaohs. Go, go look at them. They all look like this. Okay? They're all buff. There was one pharaoh, and his name is Akanakan Nakanakanakanan. He's married to Nefer Tidy Bidey Whitey Whitey. So, anyway. And the weird thing about this pharaoh is he had himself realistically portrayed in all of his, all the statues about him and all the artwork about him. So he's, he's different. He's got this weird kind of angular head, big eyes, big eyes, giant nose, small little mouth, tiny neck, tiny shoulders. And then this is the really crazy thing. Go look it up. He says, 
He's got a massive dad bod, massive dad bod. <laughs> and, and most of the drawings, they show his, his belly button, and it's like four inches across. And then he's got thunder thighs, just like huge thunder thighs, okay? And then these tiny little arms back here, and this, he's got a nice little necklace on, and that's what he looks like. And he's got the hat too, but it somehow just doesn't look as good on him. That's how he looks. What's the point of all this? The point of all this is this is what mostly happens in ancient history. We get, we get an idealized. But the Bible's not that way. The Bible tells us that King David was a mighty and incredible leader, and he was also an adulterer. The, the Bible tells us that Abraham had great courage to follow God. He also lied and manipulated and put his wife in danger. See, the New Testament, a lot of the misunderstanding is just that God is describing the reality of Iron Age people. And it's shocking to us. So the first principle is simply this. Not everything the Old Testament describes is what God prescribes. The second principle is this. Often the language of war in the Old Testament is hyperbolic. So if you read about what God says about the Canaanites, you can get pretty shocked because he's very, 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 very upset about how violent, mean, sacrificing babies, all this stuff, the Canaanites. And so he tells the nation of Israel, you've got to actually come against these people. And he uses hyperbole. We shouldn't be shocked that God uses hyperbole. We use hyperbole all the time. We all use hyperbole to make this point. Some of you are sitting here right now and you're like, I'm starving. You're not starving. You're 15 pounds overweight, if we're really honest. <laughs> 14, 15. You're not starving. The nachos will be there when you get home. And here's the last exegetical thing I want you to bring to this. Beware anthropomorphizing the motives of God. It's just a fancy word that means making him more like us. When we see God command something in the Old Testament, and we think, gosh, I shouldn't, I would never do that. That's right. Because you don't know the whole picture. I see only limited. God sees the whole scope of human history. He knows what pain will be caused if we don't take action right here, if we don't protect monotheism, if we don't get rid of idol worship that's false and, and if actually sacrifices babies. So, so oftentimes we don't understand why God does what he does because we don't have the understanding. No one wants to serve a God with my SAT scores, right? So we have to trust that God knows what he's doing. So when we read the Old Testament, we bring that understanding that it's not written to us, it's written for us. Okay, the last one. Someone say amen. We're on the last one. The Bible has been changed over many years. So this one, uh, some people get this confused with the second one, that the Romans changed Christianity. This one is more like the people that are like, I like the Bible. I like the Bible. But it's more like that game of, uh, to them, it's like that game where you whisper something in someone's ear, telephone. Have you ever played that game? So you whisper, the first person whispers, uh, the 49ers are going to play the Lions today at 3 o'clock. And then by the time it gets all the way around the whole classroom to the teacher, the last person says, the Seattle Seahawks are the best team ever. <laughs> and you're like, what? How many have played that game? Were you like me? I was the kid that when it got to me, I just made up something different just for fun. Because by the time it got to me, it was like, shabba dabba hubba bubba wusha bubba. I was like, you speak in tongues. You know, I was just. So that, that's what their argument is. The Bible has been copied and changed and copied. And some evil monk in some place has been copying it. And he took out the Jesus stuff and put his own stuff in there. And every, everyone in the past is always evil and we're always pure. By the way, there was some evil people in the past. But they're not more evil than us. We're all broken. So what is the answer to this, the Bible has been changed? Here's the answer. More than any other ancient manuscript, the Bible has thousands of surviving copies that demonstrate great continuity and doctrinal agreement. The Bible, my friend, has been preserved by God in a miraculous way. And there's so many things I could say about this. Here's what's so cool about the Bible. is you go online and you'll hear this. Oh, there is 200,000 
to 400,000 variants between the manuscripts. In other words, all the New Testament books, all the Gospels, all the writings of Paul, they disagree 200,000 to 400,000 times. And if you just hear that statistic, you're like, oh, no, we can't rely on the Bible. It has been changed. But let me tell you what these 200,000 and 400,000 variants are. They're mostly spelling errors, spaces where there shouldn't be spaces, and transposed words. In other words, the way you spell John in the Greek sometimes has two N's, and some people only put one N. Sometimes they write Jesus Christ, and sometimes they write Christ Jesus. And most of all, you can find that there's some untranslatable bits that just cause a space here or there. In other words, the Bible that we have is the Bible they had. And here's the reason there's so many variants. Because there's so many copies. More than any other ancient document, more than Homer, just name it. They've got six or seven for each of these ancient documents. We have 5,800 plus pieces of our whole manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek. We have 10,000 in Latin. And if you want to go to the early church fathers and take out all their quotes of Paul and Mark and Luke, you could put together the New Testament just from the early church fathers. Fill this in. This is, this is incredible. Additionally, most of the New Testament can be reconstructed from the writings of the early church fathers. Even if we didn't have all these manuscripts, we would still have the authentic Bible. Can I give you one more quote? Here's Dr. Matthew Harmon again. The overwhelming majority of variants are mistakes in spelling, differences in word order, the use of synonyms that have absolutely no effect on the meaning of the passage. Here's the, here's the thing you got to know. There is a God. He wants to speak to you. And he's powerful enough to preserve his word. Can I tell you just one story, one story about this? So there's these two British guys. So in the 19th century, uh, a bunch of British guys, they had a lot of money and not much time, and a lot of time on their hands. So they said, oh, let's go to Egypt and take all their valuables. So <laughs> they went over there and they went all into the pyramids and everything. And they brought all the stuff back to the museums in Great Britain. And you could still see some of this. They've given a lot of it back. But there was these two guys. I got a picture of them. Their names were Grenfell and Hunt. Grenfell and Hunt. This is a picture of them in 1896. They decided they wanted to get in on all this archaeology digging and getting all these ancient things, and maybe they'd discover some treasures. So they went over there, but they found that all of the major sites were packed with other British people smoking pipes and going, indubitably. So they didn't want to go to those places. Indubitably, yeah, that's what they said. So they decided to go to a city, and it's a city that no one else went to because it had been abandoned for years and years and years and years by the Egyptians. The name of this city is, I have to look it up every single uh, stinking time. Where is it? Uh, Oxyrhynchus. Oxyrhynchus. It's kind of like oxy, that cream you put on your face. It means sharp-nosed fish. So this city, the Egyptians cut the Nile water off to it because they didn't want it anymore. It died... Here's the key. And it stayed dry. It died and it stayed dry. So they decided to go to the city and go, well, maybe there's something there. And what they found is all the buildings have been carted off. They took the stone and they went and made other buildings with the stone. So there wasn't even really much of the buildings left there. They searched for three or four days, couldn't find anything. So they're going to leave. But the, one morning they got up and they said, before we leave, Let's go to those mounds outside of the city, and we'll dig into those mounds and see if there's something there. And they went, and they started digging, and right away they discovered that they had found the city dump. And do you know what was in the city dump? More copies of the New Testament than we ever imagined we could find. And not just copies of the New Testament, copies of other Greek, just normal contracts, copies of Egyptian, uh, uh, copies of all of this writing that had gone on. So not only did we discover just this treasure trove of, of, of the Gospels and Mark, Matthew, Luke, Corinthians, we discovered this treasure trove, but our Greek got better, so the way that we translated the New Testament got better and better and better. My friend, this is what our God did. He hid his word in a dump for you. 
And now we stand up here. Every time new papyrus are fine in the New Testament, every conservative scholar gets excited and every liberal scholar gets nervous. Because over and over and over again, think about this. Now think about this. Here's the paper that was made of. It's this grass that comes up out of the water and then it fans out up here. And they would crush it and make this really fragile paper. And then on the paper, with really primitive inks, they would take a reed, just like this, and at the top of the reed, they would cut it, just like that. Just like a fountain pen, but it was a piece of wood. And what they do when they crush this together, they'd make scrolls of it. Here's $60,000 worth of art education right now in front of you. <laughs> make the scrolls. And that's what the New Testament was written on. Fragile paper made of grass with primitive inks and a piece of wood. And for 1,400 years, listen to me, people would copy the Bible. Copy and copy and copy. 1,400 years, copy and copy and copy. With humans, what would you expect out of 1,400 years, three continents, little communities, little churches everywhere, copying and copying and copying? What would you expect? I'll tell you what you would expect. You'd expect some variance. You'd expect John with two ends in one place and John with one end in another place. I tell you what you would never expect unless God's real. You would never expect over those 1,400 years for those manuscripts to be in perfect doctrinal agreement. For them to be absolutely meant for you and me today, for it to be the same teaching as Jesus that they had as apostles that we have to the day. Here's Dr. Harmon one last time. The bottom line is that the books of the New Testament are the most reliably copied and handed down documents in the history of the world. With a high degree of confidence, we can reconstruct the very words of the authors over 99% of the time and the remaining 1%, we can always determine what it is likely the author wrote. In other words, God has spoken and he protected what he wanted to say to you. That's the Bible. That's the revelation of God. Can I pray for you? Father God, I pray that in this skeptical series, our minds would be open, our hearts would be stirred, and our lives would be changed. And it would start with putting more trust in your revealed word. I ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Hey guys, Pastor Mark here, one of the senior pastors around here. So glad that you are actually part of Bayside Online. You really are part of our family. We have grown uh, over the last couple of years online a ton, and we really do consider you as part of our church family. So what that means is make sure you subscribe and share this, it's great. Uh, but also get in a community group, start watching the Bible study, start being engaged, even give. Uh, one of the ways that we can actually do online church and have this global community and even do the ministry of our campuses is by people partnering with us in the gospel, as Paul talks about in Philippians chapter one. And that means by your resources, financially, there are people all over the world getting blessed through what we do at Bayside. And so obviously part of that is giving and using and stewarding that for the glory of God. So we super thankful if you do that. We'd love you to start doing that and just super thankful you're part of our church. So glad you're with us. Make sure that you let us know you're watching and part of this because we want to get in touch with you and thank you and serve you any way we can. Anyway, thanks guys and we will see you next week.